I've, uh, I was very uh, inspired um, by reading particularly about uh, the, in detail, the, the conflicts and the struggles and the battles that Imam Ali uh, has had um, in his caliphate. And the reason that I'm using the word caliphate in this talk because it's going to be, inshallah, um, looking at the, the years of his caliphate as opposed to just, um, or as, as opposed to his imamate. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. The caliphate of Imam Ali alayhi salam, as we know, began in turmoil and ended in turmoil. And it has given rise to numerous interpretations, perspectives and assessments from scholars of different fields. Frith Joff Shawn, in his chapter entitled Seeds of Divergence, in the volume Islam and the Perennial Philosophy, says that Ali and his family were politically ineffectual. Guy Eaton has said that he lacked a quality which is also typically Muslim, since it derives from the example of the Prophet. He was not a man of sound judgment in the affairs of the world, and his sense of timing, when to advance and when to draw back, was disastrously deficient. Others have said with regard to the conflicts that he encountered that he was in the right, but that those who campaigned against him nevertheless had good intentions. From Naj al we can get Imam Ali al-Islam's own perspective on events, which can help to clarify our understanding of the nature of his caliphate, what decisions he took, and why he took them. Beginning with the events that surrounded his being pressured into becoming caliph, we can see that from the start this was not a simple matter of a group of people electing the one whom they thought was the most pious and most worthy of becoming leader after Uthman. Rather, Imam Ali salam, was surrounded by disparate groups with various interests. Some were his sincere followers and companions. Others wanted to utilize him in the struggle for power against other groups. According to the historians, accounts of the events that took place with regard to Imam Ali al-Islam's actual election are mixed, so there can be no certainty about what actually happened. In addition, Imam Ali al-Islam was not seen by everybody as the obvious candidate for the position. al Zubayr ibn Awam considered himself the most suitable, and Aisha had been backing her nephew Talha. Furthermore, there was hanging over the imam's head the sudden accusation that he had been complicit in the murder of Uthman. There were calls from both Aisha's camp and Muawiyah's camp that he should hand over Uthman's killers in order for them to meet justice. As it is narrated, al Zahabi in Sayr al-Alam al-Nubala from Ya'la ibn Ubaid from his father who says, Abu Muslim al-Khulani and some others went to Muawiyah and asked him, do you dispute Ali or are you equal to him? Muawiyah answered, by Allah, no. I know he's better than I am and he has the right to rule. But do you not know that Uthman was killed as an innocent and I am his cousin and the seeker of his revenge? Therefore, go to Ali and tell him to send me Uthman's murderers and then I will obey him. They went to Ali and they talked to him, but Ali refused to hand over Uthman's murderers to Muawiyah. So Muawiyah's alleged words, then I will obey him, most likely refer to the fact that Imam Ali al-Islam wished to depose of all the governors whom Uthman had appointed, including Muawiyah himself. According to the historians Tabari and Balaghuri, both Talha and Zubair, claimed that they were forced to pledge allegiance 
to Imam Ali al-Islam. Many others made their excuses to Imam Ali as to why they could not or would not pledge their allegiance. And they left Medina for Mecca to join those calling for vengeance for Uthman against Imam Ali As Wilfred Madelon points out, there was now an exodus of prominent Qurayshites from Medina to Mecca. Talha and Zubair, seeing that others had successfully resisted pledging allegiance to Ali, quickly broke their own oaths and left without leave. Sermon 8 in Nahaj al-Balagha refers to this moment when al-Zubair broke from Imam Ali alayhi salam. And from this, we can see the argument that al-Zubair used. As Imam Ali alayhi salam says, he asserts that he swore allegiance to me with his hand, but did not swear it with his heart. So he does admit allegiance. As regards his claiming it otherwise than with his heart, he should come forward with a clear argument for this. Otherwise, he should return to where from he's gone out. As Ibn Abi al-Hadid explains, this sermon indeed supports the fact that al-Zubayr claims that he had to pledge allegiance under duress. Imam Ali al-Islam asks him to provide proof for this. And if he does not provide proof, then he should keep to the allegiance that he gave. In short, while al-Zubayr may have claimed to have been forced, it seems that it was not apparent either to Imam Ali al-Islam or to anyone else. Imam Ali al-Islam's caliphate was characterized by trying to implement the right against opposition from multiple sides, making practical reforms to the previously corrupt state of affairs that had been allowed to develop in the caliphate before him, and giving sermons reminding his followers of the futility of striving for worldly gains when the world is transient and death is near. In Psalm 52, he warns the people, O creatures of Allah, get ready to go out from this world, for whose inhabitants decay is ordained, and beware lest the heart's wishes should overpower you. His aversion to forcing anyone to pledge their allegiance arose not only from his sense of justice, but from the principle that an imam remains an imam whether he is recognized as such or not. In any case, many of those who pledge their allegiance would not necessarily have recognized his status as imam or understood what that entailed. Islam's caliphate was also characterized by a lack of support. Many avoided pledging their allegiance, as said, for various political or financial reasons. Thus, while some went to Mecca to join Aisha, others went to Syria to join Muawiyah, where he was cultivating support. Still others preferred to avoid the impending wars and went into exile or hiding. Some historical accounts depict those who went into exile, such as Abdallah ibn al-Zubair, as preferring a more virtuous path than engaging in war, as Imam Ali was prepared to do. So the people who preferred to avoid the war that was coming did so on the basis of virtue, thereby uh, implicitly uh, stating or implicitly uh, giving the impression that Imam Ali al-Islam was, was less virtuous because he's going to war. However, the fact remains that such people refused to offer support to the Imam, who was also the newly elected caliph of the time. It is narrated in Al-Kafi that Ali said Al-Zubayr was always with the Ahl Bayt until his son Abdullah grew up. Abdullah ibn Zubayr was drawn to Bani Taim, the tribe of Asma bint Abi Bakr, his mother. So according to Al-Tabari, Uthman gave away the Khams, which Abdullah ibn Sa'ad had obtained from the Archbishop of Tripoli in Africa to his cousin Marwan ibn Hakam. And it's known that one of the reasons why many of the Umayyads were apprehensive about Imam Ali al-Islam becoming caliph was because he would be exacting in the way that he managed the public treasury. And one of the immediate actions that he took to take back 
the large land grants that Uthman had given to his relatives. With regard to this, he says in Sermon 15, By Allah, even if I had found that by such money women had been married or slave maids had been purchased, I would have taken it back because there is wide scope in the dispensation of justice. Imam Ali al-Islam engaged in a program of redistribution of wealth and this has been interpreted by some as evidence of his weak judgment. As Madelon says, Ali's political naivety, his lack of prudence and calculation gave rise to the charge of foolishness with which Omar is said to have characterized him. These qualities became patent at the beginning of his reign in acts such as his opening the treasury and handing out money to the common people as he had promised and as he was to continue doing throughout his caliphate and his insistence on deposing all of Uthman's governors except Abu Musa al-Ashari. Why the distribution of wealth to the common people should be seen as foolishness is not entirely clear. It can be seen from his opening speech after he had been declared caliph that he was anything but weak or foolish. In Sermon 16, he addresses the crowd as a natural leader, speaking succinctly and offering insight into the people's condition. He says, you should know that the same troubles have returned to you which existed when the prophet was first sent, meaning the troubles of division, tribalism, betrayal, and revenge. He warns them of the chaos to come. He says, by Allah, who sent the prophet with faith and truth, you will be severely subverted, bitterly shaken, as in sieving, and fully mixed, as by spooning in a cooking pot, till your low persons become high, and the high ones become low. Those who were behind would attain forward positions, and those who were forward would go back. More significantly, he refers to the extent of the knowledge with which an imam is blessed, either through inheritance or through inspiration. He says, by Allah, I have not concealed a single word or spoken any lie, and I have been informed of this event and of this time. In other words, Imam Ali salam was fully aware of every angle of circumstances which had arisen. He was not one to be taken by surprise or to be at a loss when matters became disordered. This being one of the first speeches that he gave, it can be seen that he is not yet issuing military commands, nor speaking of financial issues. Rather, his first command is that the people return to the path of taqwa. He says, he who has heaven and hell in his view has no other aim. He who attempts and acts quickly succeeds, while the seeker who is slow may entertain hope of success. And now it's obvious that Imam Ali salam knew that the people were not going to hide themselves in their houses and reform themselves. But just as it is the duty of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, to give a warning, so it is the duty of the Imam. Whoever wishes to listen can do so, and if they choose not to, then, as the Imam said, I have not concealed a single word. Regarding the issue of the dimensions of the Imam's knowledge, he mentions in Sermon 174 that as an Imam, he is granted knowledge of future events. He says, by Allah, if I wish, I can tell every one of you from where he has come, where he has to go, and all his affairs. But I fear lest you abandon the Messenger of Allah in my favor. I shall certainly convey these things to the selected ones who will remain safe from that fear. The Prophet informed me of all this and also about the death of everyone who dies, the salvation of everyone who is granted salvation and the consequences of this matter, meaning the imamat or the caliphate. So interestingly, in chapter 51, volume 1 of Al-Kafi, there features a conversation 
between Imam Jafar Sadiq and one of his companions about this. It says that someone narrates, they say, I heard Abu Basir say, I said to Abu Abdullah, how is it possible for what happened to the companions of Ali to happen while they had knowledge of their deaths and what would happen to them? That is, if they knew this, why did they not try to evade their future? The Imam replied, well, he answered me as if, as if angry. He said, how is, it, how, it, how is it possible if not through their own selves? That is, if they themselves had not accepted their future. I said, what prevents you from telling your companions their future? May I be your ransom? He said, this door has been closed, except that al Hussein ibn Ali, alayhi salam, opened it a little, but only a little. That is, he informed his companions on the eve of Ashura what would befall him, what would befall them. And then he said, O oh, Abu Muhammad, indeed, they were people whose mouths were tied, that is, they could keep secrets to themselves. So we see the uh, relationship between the Imam and his followers changing over time, that gradually the followers become less trustworthy, they can't keep secrets, and so the Imams can no longer transmit the knowledge that potentially they could pass on to their Shia. With regard to this point as well, we can see how the esoteric and exoteric dimensions of Imamat were interwoven in Imam Ali salam's caliphate. <coughs> Well, one of the arguments that has been used by certain Muslim scholars for the necessity of the Ahlul Bayt to have been forcibly removed from administrative leadership over the community is that, as mentioned earlier, they were not pragmatic and did not have the ability to govern in a practically effective manner. Aisha Yuli, author of a book, as we know, uh, about Ma'awiyah's caliphate, praises Ma'awi's administrative abilities and sees his rulership as necessary for the restoration of order in the Ummah, an order that Imam Ali apparently was unable to maintain. However, as Imam Ali pointed out, while he could have instilled order through force, intimidation, bribery and threats to massacre those who did not lend their support in the way that Ma'awiyah did, he was obliged, as Imam, to hold to the path of justice and honesty, even if that came at the cost of disorder among his ranks. And thus this argument has continued down history. Should the leader compromise on upholding the high standard of justice as stipulated in Islam for the sake of administrating, of, uh, administering the Ummah? Or should he keep to the standards in spite of the opposition that such a position provokes. Imam Ali salam was clear that he could not compromise. As he says in Sermon 199, by Allah, Ma'awiyah is not more cunning than I am, but he deceives and commits evil deeds. Had I not been hateful of deceit, I would have been the most cunning of all men. But the fact is that every deceit is a sin, and every sin is a disobedience to Allah, and every deceitful person will have a banner by which he will be recognized on the day of judgment. By Allah, I cannot be made forgetful by strategy, nor can I be overpowered by hardships. This narration where Imam Ali salam said that the Holy Prophet opened to me a thousand gates of knowledge and through each of those gates was another thousand gates. Some years later, someone came to Imam Jafar Sadiq and they say to Imam Jafar Sadiq, is it true that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, revealed a thousand gates of knowledge to Imam Ali and, and, and through each gate was another thousand gates. 
And Imam Jafar says, yes, that's correct. And the person asking, he says, okay, so how many out of those gates of knowledge did he manage to transmit to the Shia? And Imam Jafar Sadiq replies, two. Two out of those gates. So we can conclude here, as we know, that when Imam Ali salam says that he is the gate to the city of knowledge, this isn't a light statement. And if we have not been able to benefit from the knowledge that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt al had to transmit to their Shia, it is unfortunately because the Shia did not prove themselves to be trustworthy and to keep the secrets that the Imams salam, transmitted to them. <coughs> so we conclude here with a, with a call to all other scholars to look carefully at the Caliphate of Imam Ali salam, in order to see that he was well aware, based on his knowledge of his situation, of the death of every one of his companions, what their circumstances would be, who is going to be saved, and the future events of the salvation of the future Shias. And I'll conclude here. Thank you very much. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Allah.